Welcome everybody back to our webinar series Developing Superb Trading Strategies. My name is always Stefan, Stefan Friedrichowski. And thanks to Argos FX who made that webinar series possible for each of us. Yeah, so um, you see, uh, as always, uh, the first information here on the slide, um, our agenda as well as the date, and I have to mention the date as well here for the recording. So today is the 30th of March 2017 already, so the first quarter is nearly ended. But anyhow, uh, that's not our topic here. Um, as always, I have to mention the risk warning, as you know. So we talk about trading strategies, setups, and so on. But if you do your own trading, you do it, of course, simply on your own, but that you know. Well, so that has to be done every time as usual. So you uh, find already the slides for today. Um, ready for download uh, in your go to webinar control panel and um, yeah and one another announcement as today will be the last one of that uh, series um, there will be other things coming soon but uh, at least uh, today is the last one for this um, webinar series but anyhow you know how to reach me there are two email addresses already on my first slide and you see one is uh, friedrichowski at argosfx.com and the other one uh, a more uh, private one let's call it that is uh, stefan at daytradingcampus.de so uh, if you during the next couple of weeks uh, still want to, want to get in touch with me um, just send me an email and um, yeah, I hope I can react fast. Of course, I have to admit that there are still questions a little bit open right now. Um, so I have to apologize, but I have been simply too busy. But um, I will make sure that you will get your answers, of course. <laughs> and, um, that is uh, sure. So today, um, yeah, I want to give you um, one not another view on Renko charts because um, especially during uh, the last couple of days um, the view you get via Renko charts is quite uh, interesting um, has to do with the movements uh, um, within our markets but anyhow let's have a look on that and then there will be an update on our looking for a trading edge uh, I have done some additional work on that and um, so I want to share the results with you, of course. Uh, there are surprising ones, disappointing ones, so everything is uh, in there. But uh, you will see later. <clears throat> and finally, because I mentioned already that this is the last uh, webinar of this series, um, I would a little bit summarize my view on trading in general. Uh, you see already in brackets uh, my beliefs, uh, so don't take it, um, yeah, just by word or <laughs> uh, so it's, you can believe whatever, but uh, so it's more an opinion statement of how I look to trading activities, trading setups, so trading at all, and uh, that should a little bit summarize our webinar series here. So let's come back to uh, questions and answers, but um, as I mentioned, uh, there are still two things uh, to be done, and uh, I will follow up on that uh, quite soon. But uh, those uh, two links are still the one about machine learning. There have been, um, that I can mention, some additional emails uh, mentioning, hey, that's a brilliant idea um, to go into that topic a little bit more. So I will think about that. Um, but it needs some time for me as well because I'm not already an expert in machine learning but um, so I try to do but uh, uh, that is a little bit longer path to go so it's learning for me as well but um, if that is ready uh, of course there will be webinar series about machine learning and trading um, later but it needs a couple of months for me as well because I have to learn and um, I want at least be that um, prepared that I can really answer uh, some questions on that as well. 
Good. So I mentioned I want to um, have a view on Renko charts once again, and uh, yeah, that's the view here, which is uh, quite interesting because uh, you see my uh, general overview about those six uh, euro forex pairs, and uh, it's amazing how obvious uh, one can realize. Um, uh, for example, that uh, Euro Swiss francs, that there's nothing happening at all. And if you look to a standard chart of um, Euro Swiss franc, then you might realize movements, movements, and but finally, um, it's only a question of scale uh, of your chart and uh, finally you will realize that there happens nothing and <laughs> in this case looking for those Renko charts with uh, that kind of indicator here because now the timeline uh, is valid uh, within that <clears throat> chart uh, you see lots of vertical dotted lines and those lines are um, the um, what is it called the the, the period uh, separator so it uh, period means here one day so every um, dotted uh, black line uh, vertical black line is um, the separator for a day and you see lots of days um, for euro swiss franc and that's already an indicator uh, that there's nothing happening at all but on the other hand, what you can realize here as well is that there are forex pairs with really strong movements and those movements behave, um, let's call it, quite well. For example, if we go for, and I will enlarge it um, here for uh, the chart of um, Euro Australian dollar, uh, then it's really interesting to have those extremely obvious and straight lines or more or less straight lines that big upwards movement starting at uh, about uh, 20th of May and uh, March <laughs> May is a little bit in the future from now and you see a strong movement upwards uh, of course as always wiggling around a little bit up and downs and then the strong move downwards so um, of course, you can see the same in a regular chart as well, but the movement itself in terms of the specific zigzag, um, that is much more obvious within those Renko charts and uh, I still believe that we can do something out of those charts as well because um, we can trade those pullbacks for example uh, so if you have uh, such a straight line downwards for example then and I don't want to talk about Fibonacci retracement because in general I don't uh, believe in that concept but uh, I believe in pullbacks and um, so uh, maybe one would uh, place an order even uh, for example uh, here um, do I get a here for example is that, uh, at that position there would be a sell uh, limit order uh, placed somewhere here okay that one would have not been filled but uh, to have those pullbacks and then going on um, into the direction of uh, that uh, movement could be a, um, a good idea to follow up on that uh, and those ideas are at least from from my point of view, more obvious in those Renko charts than in any other chart. And even here, those what's normally in technical analysis uh, called support or resistant lines, um, yeah, they become even much more obvious uh, here than in any other chart. I have to mention that in principle, I don't like that concept of resistant and support lines because that's more a thinking of um, what, I, what I always call the private uh, traders. Um, the big players would not use those lines, but they might help us um, anyhow. So uh, it's a mixture between the belief and uh, what's possible with that. I would go more of like percentage wise pullbacks and um, then try to come into that trend behavior here and not related to Fibonacci retracements, uh, just um, 
some arbitrary numbers to be optimized via backtesting. Okay, so that's uh, one example here <clears throat> for Renko charts and um, uh, let me just uh, show you another one, uh, which is this one here, Euro Canadian dollar. And it's a little bit similar to the uh, previous one. So within the last three days, we have strong movement downwards. Um, and um, yeah, this is, those moves here are really um, well seen within those Renko charts. Just a second. Sorry, I have uh, sometimes to, to mute my microphone here um, because I got a cold uh, a little bit and I tried to cough uh, only with um, microphone on mute, but uh, hopefully uh, it will work always and um, I do not disturb you <laughs> uh, too much. So that is uh, a little bit about Renko charts here because I like the concept and uh, I mentioned that we even might use similar concepts in uh, backtesting of strategies uh, simply in order to compress a huge amount of data um, to data which still have the information we need and um, the most important information is the price movement and that is still within any Renko um, a chart or something which is similar to a Renko chart, so it helps to compress data and, um, and to get rid of uh, if there's nothing happening at all. Um, but the drawback is we use a little bit of the time information, but uh, anyhow, um, since we more live from the movements for trading than from time, time is more something we suffer because if a trade goes too long then we uh, encounter uh, swap costs but um, since the movement itself is more important than the swaps then therefore I think still we have an advantage here even if we lose some time information by compressing our data uh, via those um, the bricks here uh, uh, within the rank chart. So it helps to get um, faster uh, backtesting uh, algorithms or backtesting uh, activities. So back to my slides here. Um, so going back to uh, what I call searching the edge, uh, just as a short reminder, um, what we more or less use here is um, the fact that we use uh, rate of changes with different periods and that is indicated within that picture here. Um, we have, in, in my picture, we have five red lines. Those five red lines um, indicate uh, five different uh, rate of changes um, derived for different um, periods or different number of candles looking back. Uh, and that is the kind of concept I use right now for developing uh, a trading strategy uh, because it's, um, yeah, it creates something what I call a pattern, um, but not a pattern like a typical candlestick pattern, but it's um, a single number or better to say a vector um, which describe the current market in terms of how far away was the move, uh, was the price, uh, for example, six candles um, in the past, 10 candles, 20, 40, 80, whatever. So therefore, that vector of those four, five numbers um, stand for a typical or a situation, um, a, a pattern within the uh, history and now the question is what to do next? Um, should we open a trade? Um, if, what kind of trade? Um, so therefore the question mark here and all we have to do is to make up our mind, of course uh, we do it via an algorithm, uh, to say yes we want to trade and what kind of trade we uh, want to enter. And to summarize what 
is now to be done and uh, to summarize what we have done already um, a little bit more. So what we use is we use those rate of change patterns within the past and we use a certain length of overall history. So what I mean is um, I look more, for example, back the last um, 10,000 uh, M5 candles and um, for every point with for those 10,000 um, candles, I always have a description, a pattern, um, like the picture on my previous slide. So I have what I call the situ a situation in terms of those five numbers. Um, and by the way, whether it should be five or 10 or 20, uh, I don't know. So uh, we will see that it's uh, still one degree of freedom, how many um, weight of changes we use. So uh, the, dimen um, the dimen dimension of that vector to describe a situation, um, a status, is uh, still in question or is um, under investigation. So having those situations, we can group them in terms of similar patterns and we apply a methodology which is called KNN, K nearest neighbors. Um, so we have all those patterns and we look for patterns which are similar. So, for example, if we have the, currently the situation like this, then we look back within our last 10,000 candles, where do we have similar patterns, similar, uh, a similar structure within the history? And uh, we will always find similar situations. And the good thing is now, because we look in the history, we look the future from those points in time, so we know how the price has moving on in the past for such a typical pattern. So we can average all those patterns which are similar to our current one, and then we get an average prediction for um, for our current situation. And having that average prediction, we have now two possibilities how to move on. And the two possibilities are the one which I called the position trading. And uh, you remember that I mentioned, okay, I have a prediction and that prediction, for example, is positive, meaning the price should go upwards. And then we can use that information to say, okay, uh, long is the right direction and uh, we open a long trade. Then one and five can later we get a new prediction and maybe that prediction is different or it supports our uh, already ongoing position. And then we have the question, we may change, we may increase uh, our long position or we for example, if we have already built up several long positions and now we get uh, a prediction to the south, then we use it as a signal to close stepwise our uh, uh, long position and finally maybe uh, changing into um, an overall short position. That is something I call position trading because it's not directly related to a specific stop loss or specific take profit. So we have to um, calculate carefully our risk and we need some, some emergency uh, stop losses still because uh, we don't want to risk everything. Um, but uh, that kind of, um, of um, uh, methodology or a way of trading um, is quite interesting. Honest, uh, uh, no, uh, <laughs> I have not um, uh, done something on that already, but um, what I can um, do already is the other way, 
but still this precision trading um, has a follow-up uh, on my end because I think it's a quite interesting idea um, and uh, in, yeah, another way of how to trade the market, um, just moving around with our position and position size. It's uh, more uh, what uh, is called an MT5 like trading, so a real position trading or the one uh, normally is done with uh, futures as well. But anyhow, so that is the one possible path we can go, and the other one is um, that we do it in a way we normally develop strategies and what uh, we normally do is we open a trade and that trade has a stop loss, that trade has a take profit or in my language a risk reward multiplier or, um, um, so a take profit and maybe it's a good idea to have uh, something like a maximum trade duration so don't open the trade uh, for, for, for months. Um, so that would be three degrees of freedom um, and now what we can do is and uh, what I, I go back to the previous slide just um, because we know in the history similar situations with a similar pattern and what we can simulate quite easily, well, with my uh, already uh, programmed uh, uh, tools, I can optimize for all those similar situations, what kind of trade should I enter and with what stop loss, with which take profit and which maximum duration. And those things I can use um, and going to all those similar patterns in the past, getting that information, long, short, stop loss, take profit and uh, maximum duration of that trade and then, oh, back to that slide, having done that kind of optimization, I can now open that trade here um, at the end of the chart and still, because I do it um, under the methodology back forward testing, I can you um, do it in the past and look for the what I always then call the future trades. Um, so um, completely in line with that uh, walking forward um, methodology. So that is something I have done now. Um, but before I sh uh, show you some results, I want to mention what are the most critical points here. And uh, the most critical points are the number of um, neighbors, so the number of similar patterns to be chosen. So I can go for 10, for 100, or 1000, or whatever. So I, I need a critical or a number of how many patterns I call similar, so it has a little bit to do with uh, the, that kind of similarity criteria, but I can simply, for example, say I want always to have 10 neighbors or 10, 10 similar patterns and I go simply for the 10 with the smallest distance or 20 or 100. So that is a quite crucial number here, how many um, neighbors of that investigation I should use. Then next critical number is the number of um, ROCs or so the number of let's call them still indicators or which finally is the um, dimension of my, my uh, vector which describes a situation. So that is crucial how many of those I should go for. And uh, that dimensionality, um, yeah, is critical. And um, looking a little bit more from a mathematical point of view, um, it means if you go into higher dimensions, so for example, if you go for 10 or 20, uh, then at least in the literature, you can find um, comments that um, if you go in higher dimensions, um, typically 
you not gain any more information or the concept of neighbors uh, is getting more um, strange or maybe not that good. So um, that is at least something you can read in the literature. Finally, what, what is really important and critical um, are the costs of trading. So, because I want now, and what I have done previously was always without any costs, just looking for a prediction. But as we know, um, our trading involves costs, involves spreads, commissions, so whatever. Um, and the swap costs, if we have uh, long going trend, uh, trades, then uh, those numbers uh, are extremely um, important because they can ruin uh, finally uh, such a kind of strategy. So, before I, um, uh, you will see it already because I switched my slide, uh, my, um, uh, this one we will discuss um, in a minute, but I want to show you something. Uh, that's a brief excourse uh, into uh, C programming. Not it, real C programming, but uh, mistakes. And uh, I want to talk about my own fault as well, um, just uh, to, to make you uh, aware that uh, if you um, see something which might be looking strange, then in most cases it's really strange and uh, there's a mistake in that. So, um, although that picture is similar to one we have had in the previous slide and at that point in time the, uh, the, uh, it was correct, but here um, it's a simulation or that back forward methodology for um, three different underlines and um, exactly following the idea which I introduced um, uh, a minute ago so that we really have always traits with a certain stop loss and a certain uh, risk reward ratio and a certain trade duration. Yeah, and those are my equity lines, which are extremely good. And if I see something like that, because it's a, not the first time I have results like uh, this one here, uh, then there's a red uh, light uh, alarm uh, switching on because it looks too good. And I try to figure out, hey, what is a mistake? Normally, in those cases, in most cases, um, the mistake is uh, what uh, I call including the future in your prediction. Uh, that is something you can do quite easily in Excel, in uh, C programming, in whatever, uh, that you, for whatever reason, you include um, by mistake uh, already the future in your decision and then it's quite obvious that you do the right decisions and um, then might be uh, the result that uh, your equity lines look like this one here. Uh, in this case, I checked for that, no, no involving the future already in my de decision. And what was it, finally? Uh, it was an error in the setting up an array. So you need arrays in programming and normally what you do is you you have those arrays. Uh, I'll just show you an example. For example here, um, there's an array which is called float blah 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 and then you have to mention or you have to enter here the dimensions. And exactly that was a, uh, the mistake because my, my array was too small. It was this number 33 and uh, previously there was a 15. And what does it mean? Normally when you start your C program later, you get what is called a segmentation fault and uh, your, your program stops. But if you are still within the limits of where you can use uh, the memory, then you don't get that segmentation fault. Your program is running, uh, but you write somewhere in the memory and later you read a variable and that gets some strange values. And that is something which is really crucial um, and I want to mention so, such a fault here as well. So it was only 
the uh, wrong dimension or the, the, the wrong uh, limits for that array, which finally result that nice equity lines. Um, so I cannot really explain why that mistake leads to those equity lines. The only thing I know is I write into the memory somewhere and later I read somewhere uh, variables and I get the wrong answers. Um, yeah, and in this case uh, I have really nice equity lines but um, they are wrong. So um, a little bit disappointing, but um, um, there's a sentence which looks too good to be true, is too good to be true. And uh, that sentence is in most cases right. So those equity lines would be a dream, uh, but they are nonsense. So anyhow, real equities how it looks like right now. And um, what I want to show you here is, I don't go really to all the details here, um, it just uh, keeps that image as it is. You see here a couple of different uh, equity lines for the last uh, 10 years. Um, all the, the y-axis here is um, um, the result in Rs, so in unit of risk. Um, so finally we have numbers between minus 4,000 and plus 4,000 uh, in that range. So huge range and completely different equity curves. So you might think, hmm, quite disappointing um, because um, no equity line should be my trading account, um, even those which are still positive at the end and at least half of them are um, slightly positive uh, even at the end after 10 years of, of um, back forward back testing, um, still they don't look good, uh, no question. What are the differences here between all those equity lines? Differences are mainly the number of neighbors, which I take into account in that similarity patterns, then the dimension um, or the number of um, the rate of changes, and the maximum duration of a trade. So I changed um, those numbers and you see I get completely different results um, and they are not that promising at all, but all those results look quite better if I make spreads, commission and so on to zero, then they look really good, but I know we finally we don't have that within our trades, so we have to live with those spreads, commissions and swaps. Um, but there's still already something we can learn out of that. And how to learn out of those strange equity lines, I will show you uh, really online here. And I will go for the green equity, um, yeah, this one here. And that one, I want to um, go in Excel with that equity. And I want to show you how you can see already some uh, yeah, some some ideas how to get those equity lines better or how to learn from that kind of uh, equity because currently what we are doing is, I go, um, or yeah, let me switch to that. Um, I go back here. What we currently are doing is we open all the time a new trade. So with every end of a five minute candle, no, in my case now it's an uh, uh, H1, but anyhow. Um, so at the end of every candle, we do that kind of optimization and open a new trade. And only if the back testing is telling me um, in average there was nothing profitable, then I would not trade, but in most cases I get a potential 
average trade which has been profitable. So in most cases I open it with every candle a new trade and that might be too heavy because um, my situations are maybe let's call it not good enough and in order to come to some first conclusions or in general to what's going on here um, I open that sheet here with all the trades and um, we you don't have really to go into the details but you see I have uh, 60,000 lines so it's 60,000 trades all back forward testing and um, yeah and finally we are still positive at uh, 1,900R uh, but uh, you know the green line in my picture um, that looks not that good but now I do the following I just create a new sum here so um, GV means that it's a, a result of a single trade and let me sum up uh, all the trades um, uh, once again um, so this one plus this so I just uh, want to um, get a new sum because later we will sort our trades um, in a new way so let's get a picture and now I hope my computer is uh, fast enough uh, that we don't have to to wait always that long but um, um, it's here already it, it takes some time to get that graph uh, so now what I do is I get the same equity graph than in the GNU plot um, but um, later I will sort those trades um, along some criterias and the criterias I want or what I want to look I want to answer the following question for example um, I have all those trades have maybe different maximum durations and what I would like to see is is there maybe that if the computer optimizes hey I only want to go for um, maximum duration of maybe um, uh, 64 candles um, maybe all those more shorter trades are loser trades and if we can get conclusions like that then we know what to do better we might skip those trades that would be the easiest one or we might even tell the computer don't use uh, those short uh, trades anymore and only thing I have to do is here I have to sort now all the trades along some criteria and I start with another one which is um, already impressive at the moment when I start a trade ah no now I press the wrong button uh, that ruins here all I have done um, because I press the button uh, make make a new graph here and uh, that is now totally wrong because it tries now to get all those things here into one graph now it's getting crazy here um, so what can I do um, so I can stop everything but um, then we have to restart everything oh. But nevertheless, that is the best one. Uh, so I have to stop everything and uh, redo everything. So then I get hopefully um, what I want to share with you here. <laughs> um, so it takes some time because I have simply killed um, my my Excel or my my Open Office. So. Yeah, I'm sure. So, just a second. Take some coffee or whatever is needed. Um, sorry for that delay, but now we have to do everything uh, once again. Hopefully, it's getting faster now. So we get the data, and we have first to prepare a new sum of all the trades because we want to change the order uh, according to my sorting criteria um, and uh, therefore we cannot live with the sum anymore 
which is already here because we want yeah, something like uh, to filter the trades according to one specific criteria. So let me get the graph once again here and uh, that will be the green uh, curve as uh, previously uh, in the GNU plot chart. By the way, using um, GNU plot uh, for all those things is um, a very good idea because GNU plot in charting is much faster than uh, Excel or anything else. I don't know. So therefore, um, GNU plot is really the best choice for um, looking for charts with uh, millions of data points. And Excel always has a lot of problems here. So anyhow, uh, I hope I get it now right. So lines and get me the line. Still, we have to look to the um, sand clock here. Uh, good. So now you see already the, the equity, which is exactly the same than the green line um, in the GNU plot chart. Uh, it's really not <laughs> um, an equity line we want to have in our trading account. So now sorting. And the first I want to sort now is I want to sort my data or my trades, my list of trades, according to the ATR value at trade opening. So because I know the ATR value whenever I know, uh, open a trade, I now sort my trades along that column, ATR. So all the trades are listed now um, against uh, the ATR values, smallest first, highest ATR values last. And if we now look back to that equity line, keep in mind that the, the sequence of trades is not now anymore time-wise. It's in the sequence of ATR values. Why do I do something like that? What I now know are more or less two things. Because the ATR value increases if I go from the left to the right, I know that for most small ATR values, I get not that good trades. So that's already a hint. If the ATR is too small, don't open a trade. Because finally, those bring me nothing. And what's... <coughs> sorry. Astonishing at the end, at the highest ATR values, that pseudo equity goes down quite fast. What does it mean? Whenever we have extremely high values of ATR, we should not open a trade. So we can draw conclusions already from here, which are very interesting. I do another sorting because I need a stop loss for my trades. And um, you know that I always use a multiplier uh, to the ATR value uh, for stop loss setting. And uh, now what I do is I sort my trades um, according to column P and P is a stop loss multiplier. That means now the first trades in that row or in, in, in the chart are those with the smallest stop loss multiplier and um, going from the left to the right uh, the stop loss multiplier increases and now we can draw similar conclusions. So having extremely small stop loss multipliers is maybe not the best and to have extremely high, because those are at the end of the chart, is once again not that good. So we can use even that um, very easy to get analysis of our trading lists in order to draw some conclusions, for example, either to modify our, our window where we look for good trades in the range for uh, spe uh, specific degrees of freedom or 
we could even say we skip those trades, which would be the easiest one, and uh, that would enhance the overall result quite impressively. I have to make the remark um, against the overfitting, so we don't have to, to filter too much, too heavily, because uh, then, of course, we get extremely good final result, but um, that is not derived automatically by the walk forward methodology, so uh, it, it's uh, our personal input. So that's the way how I will proceed with that, because now I get already two ideas, looking for the ATR value, or for example here, uh, looking for the stop loss multiplier, change the, the search criteria, um, not going for a very small one, not going for a very high one, and so on, and then we do those equity lines and um, try to enhance my result. So since, okay, it does not look already that extremely good, but um, I see already some, some good ideas uh, how to get improvements, but uh, we will see uh, how that finally comes out. Good, that's for looking for trading edge. Um, I think I'm close already to uh, where I want to be and uh, then the, that will be a quite interesting new trading strategy. Um, I would apply further that uh, to uh, other underlyings and so on and so on. Finally, as I mentioned, uh, I just want to share with you some thoughts about trading uh, since I mentioned that um, this will be the last webinar today uh, and um, therefore, yeah, just some thoughts or a list of thoughts, it's just two slides, how I think how we, be we can become profitable with our trading um, doing similar things like this or any other kind of uh, strategy development uh, via backtesting, via whatever you do. So my thinking is that profitable trades can be made only in those situations which really deviate from the normal. And you see already there's a direct link to what we have done in the last couple of minutes. Since my equity, my original equity line was opening more or less a trade every hour, that's not a good idea because in most cases we know that um, we are not deviating from the normal and the normal is the random behavior of our prices and we know that the prices are quite close to the random walk and we know as well that we cannot beat the random walk so we cannot uh, within the completely random walk we cannot be profitable so we need that deviation from the normal and only if we are in a specific situation which really deviates from what is typical then we can be profitable so that's exactly that missing link within what I showed you during the development of the um, last uh, trading strategy. But I take that sentence in general more, uh, yeah, more general. So whenever we look for trading strategies, there should be something involved which figures out, figures out that we are normal or not normal. How, how do you, you define that normal and not normal is still uh, something in question, but it is needed because we need those abnormal situations. Next thing is that I strongly believe that thinking in candles, time frames like M1, H4, whatever, does not help at all. Or if you uh, look for other webinars or, or reviews um, that somebody uh, has derived a strategy on D1 
and then is telling, you can apply the same strategy to H1 or M5. My personal thinking, nonsense. Um, this will never uh, be um, profitable. Why? Our stock prices, uh, uh, either stocks or forex, whatever, are simply time series and they only consist of prices in a time ordered manner. So, <laughs> coming from left to the right. The time itself is only useful if you think about special events like, like uh, half past two, um, non-farmers payroll data on Friday or whatever. Or if you think about trading hours at all, so thinking about openings like uh, FDAX opens at 8 o'clock and closes at uh, 10 p.m. Or if you think about uh, faces like in the night um, we have uh, higher spreads and no movements. So the time information itself is good for those things, but looking for different kind of charts, uh, charts like uh, H4, M5, whatever, doesn't really help us um, because a candle is only a summary of a specific time and nothing else. So um, what's much more important is the price move and not the time. The move is what finally makes our trades profitable or not. Those just candle considerations does not help. Where to set stop losses, take profits and trade duration and there's a link to that different time frames like um, M1, H4, whatever. The time frame for a trade is mainly driven by spreads and commission and swap costs because you know that there is a typical movement or how far a price can go within a specific time and if you want to trade on M1 and you want to have a profitable trade in two minutes typically the movements are much too small in order to compensate the costs of trades. So what is the right time frame if I talk about time frame is more related to spreads, commissions and costs than to the time frame itself. And the link from, from price change to movement that is more or less statistically because we we know those typical movements after a specific time. But for us more important is the move and not the time. So if you think about chicken and egg uh, as a problem which one is first. Relevant is the move and not the time. So therefore um, I make that statement. Thinking about uh, indicators at all I don't think that there are lots of indicators which are really helpful. Um, from a mathematical point of view, all those indicators are um, a function of the history to the current situation or to the uh, current um, point in time. So it's only a view to the history and some function which connects uh, 100 last candles to a single number. Nevertheless, I mention here three indicators which I think are really useful. And the first one is ATR because it measures the overall volatility and we have to think in high volatility phases, low volatility phases and that has a direct impact how and where to set stop losses, take profits and so on. Therefore ATR is something good for me. EMAs are good as well. Why? Because they they take out some noise of the data. They, they do that averaging and um, 
getting rid of the noise helps me to make the better decisions. Therefore, I think EMAs are something which is good. And last, are those rate of changes, because they describe situations. They describe, for example, huge movements. We talk about power candles, and in that point in time, we talk about power candles on a specific time frame, like H1. Whenever we see a huge movement within an H1 candle, we came to some specific conclusions. I would today rephrase that kind of thing simply by saying, if there's a big rate of change, um, so whenever we have big changes, and I don't care about whether it's in, within five minutes or 68 minutes, if we have huge deviations from the normal, then we can use that information and um, build this, that information into our strategy. Therefore, those rate of changes with different time frames um, are something okay. And of course, the time itself. Once again, only because of those things like trading hours, opening, uh, so opening of trading hours or uh, trading events or uh, night, daytime, because prices change or the price, the typical movements change um, for specific time scales or specific times of the day. Just three other things here as well. Uh, just a second. In general, I would like to summarize that we have two ways of uh, trading activities, and that's exactly those two which I mentioned um, within the development of the current strategy. One is what I call this position trading, but of course this needs a risk management as well. So moving around with a position size, uh, increasing, decreasing, uh, changing the direction. Uh, so that's one possibility in general. And the other one is the more single trade consideration. So single trade, um, in a sense, you open a trade, this trade gets a stop loss, trade gets a take profit, and for example, a maximum duration. And even if you um, um, think uh, about additional aspects like uh, trailing stops and so on, but um, it doesn't change the concept because it only means, so there's some point in time and at that point in time, you open a trade, and that trade has a specific setting, and uh, you apply that setting. So it's a single trade um, trading activity. Even finally, if there are multiple trades in different uh, symbols or whatever, uh, but uh, it's trading with single um, decision, decisions. Yeah, one additional remark, what I personally think is that uh, the machines are always better than uh, just uh, the normal trader. Uh, so finally, uh, those algorithms we can derive by those kind of activities we have been done during the last couple of months, um, that is a way of trading I personally think is uh, much better than anything else. Uh, reason behind is yeah, quite obvious. Um, the computer can can manage much more information than I can in much shorter time, and we can use the computer to to optimize whatever we want to optimize. So therefore, uh, finally, I think the machine is always better, but I don't have a proof. Um, and the last remark. Um, I want to make here is that I don't think that it really helps that we use technical analysis with those um, things like like uh, um, flex and and uh, triangles and support lines and so on. Um, one sentence: Why? Uh, whenever you have created your own random price chart, um, you will find all those things in that random price chart as well. So our eye, our brain, 
um, looks exactly for those things like visual information of support line, resistance lines. Um, it's a little bit like if you look to the sky and see some clouds and you remember being a child, then uh, there was a game, hey, I see an elephant, uh, I see a lion and so on. Yes, that's right, um, but we want to see um, exactly in that chaos some order and whenever something fits um, to our experience, uh, yeah, then we call uh, the cloud um, all of a sudden an elephant. Or so that's we. Our brain uh, is um, trained to see those patterns, but all those patterns occur in uh, random walk movements as well. So therefore, I question mark. Um, that they are really valid. But I can only question mark, I cannot prove the opposite. So uh, therefore still technical analysis is um, on the table and since I can't prove that's wrong, uh, so why not? And by the way, principal ideas for strategies hmm, I get out of similar um, observations. But all those observations need the final cross-check within um, statistics in backtesting and so being an idea delivery for new trading um, ideas and trading setups, I like it. I like to look to charts and get new ideas how to get a new strategy up and running. Good. So that were just some thoughts um, I want to share with you and uh, still although the webinar series ended here now uh, you can still be in contact with me, you see the both email addresses friedrichowski at argoselix.com and stefan at daytradingcampus.de so uh, it would be a pleasure for me to um, be still in contact with you to discuss some ideas and uh, whatever you have in mind. So I want to help you as far as I can. Yeah, so that's for now. Um, see you somewhere, I don't know where, but uh, I'm sure we will see each other or hear each other uh, once again. Thank you very much for attending that webinar series over the last couple of months. Thanks to Argus Evix who made that webinar series possible. Yeah, have a good time and always good trades. Bye-bye.